Awesome. So here's, is it working? Yeah. So here's the outline of the presentation. So we study active matter. So first I will start by defining what is active matter. And then I will go on to uh, present some of the models we use because what we study active matter by modeling it. So I will introduce some very well known models uh, that are used in the active matter community. And then I will explain you, I will show you what happens to the physics of active Brownian particles when you add different alignment rules. And I will show you this by showing results from simulations that we got. And also I will explain you how to derive a coarse grain theory that successfully describes this kind of system that we study. And finally, I will briefly state the conclusions we got from our work. So what is active matter? I'm sure you all know, but I will yet repeat it once again. So active matter is composed of units that constantly consume energy to do something, which can either be self-propel or self-divide or exert forces. And now I'm gonna show you some videos. Here you can see a person walking, a bird flying or some bacteria swimming. Now, what do these systems have in common? First, they are living systems and second, these systems are constantly consuming energy here to move, to self-propel. Now, I'm gonna show you some videos I really like a lot. So what happens when you put a bunch of these particles all together? And from now on, I will just be talking about particles. What happens is what you see in these other videos. Organization emerges at the larger scale. So these particles are able to spontaneously organize to show the onset of collective behavior and the formation of patterns and structures. And as you see, this behavior happens across scales and is due to the non-equilibrium nature of the system because these part particles are constantly consuming energy, so they are breaking detail balance at the level of each constituent. And so this is very interesting behavior and inspired by these or as a motivation, some people have also synthesized active particles in the lab. And here I'm going to show you examples of some experiments. These are light activated colloids and these experiments were performed by Palazzi. And here you can see that when you turn on the light, these particles can self propel. So they become active and then they aggregate and they form this kind of clustered structures. And when you turn off the light, they just behave as passive colloids. And then I'm going to show you some other examples. The second one is uh, some colloidal rollers and these experiments were done at the Bartolo lab. And the third example is some Janus colloids which were synthesized at ETH in Zurich. And in these two cases, when you apply an electric field, these particles become active, they can self-propel. And so they form the onset of collective motion. Like in the second case, you see this band that propagates towards the left-hand side of the box. And in this third case, you see the formation of fronts that propagate. So often in the experiments, these experiments involve complex interactions between the agents. But from a theoretical standpoint, these systems provide us with a good framework to study out of equilibrium systems. And what we try to do, what I've tried to do in my, in my PhD and also what many people try to do is to model this kind of behavior. And today I will be talking about dry active models. And dry here means that we're not explicitly simulating the solvent surrounding the particles. And this is a classification of dry active models based on two symmetries. The first one, which is associated to the alignment interaction between particles. The second one is associated to how activity enters the system. So today I will talk about a very well-known model, which is called the active Brownian particle model. And this one describes particles with polar activity so they are, first of all, isotropic particles, so disks or spheres, depending on if you are in 2 or 3D. And they have polar activity. So this means that they carry an arrow pointing along the direction in which they self-propel. I will also talk about the Vitchek model. And this one also describes particles with polar activity, but which can now align their direction of self-propulsion with the direction of self-propulsion of their neighbors. And in the seminal model, proposed by Vitschek, they had polar alignment. But further extensions of this model have also considered nematic alignment. And actually, in the class of nematic alignment, you can also consider alignment induced by collisions between elongated particles. 
And finally, I would also like to talk about another mechanism to introduce effective alignment between particles in a system, and this is based on dipolar interactions. So I'm going to start by the basics. I'm going to present you the active Brownian particle model. And here you can see the overdone Langevin equations, which describe a system of particles that self-propel at constant speed, V0. They are subject, okay, I have pointer. They are subject to thermal and rotational noise, and they interact through excluded volume interactions. So they are disks, they have a finite size. And then in these kind of models, we observe a phase separation. And the picture is the following one. When two of these active particles collide, they get stuck due to the persistence in their motion. And it takes a while for them to be able to decorrelate and, and be their direction of self-propulsion and be able to escape. But if in the meantime, other particles arrive and collide with these two particles, they will block them. So it will be even more difficult for these two particles to escape. And this is the mechanism that triggers the aggregation of particles and the eventual phase separation of the system. And here you can see a video where at high enough values of self-propulsion and of the density, you see that the system actually phase separates into a dense and a dilute phase. And this is called motility-induced phase separation, and it happens in the absence of attractive interactions. Now, the second model I would like to talk about today is the Witschek model. And this one des describes point-like particles, which can now self-propel again, but they can align their direction of self-propulsion with the direction of self-propulsion of their neighbors. And in this kind of systems, we observe another phase transition, transition, which is called the flocking phase transition. And at high enough values of the alignment strength, this these systems show the onset of global orientational order. So basically, particles can align their directions of self-propulsion, and they can swim collectively. And then we see the formation of traveling structures, like the one you see here in this simulation, where the color of uh, particles depicts their orientation. So they are all pointing more or less in the same direction. And so you see this band that moves towards the right-hand side of the box. And these were some simulations performed by a former student of the group. Now, at the beginning of my PhD, we asked ourselves, what happened to this motility-induced phase separation when you add some kind of alignment rule between the particles? And to answer this question, we started studying this model that you see here, and which by now should sound a bit familiar already to you, because this is basically the active Brownian particle model where we introduce effective torques between neighboring particles. And then we study two types of effective torques, one which has polar or ferromagnetic symmetry. And from now on, I will be using these two words indistinguishably. So when particles are subject to ferromagnetic alignment, they can align their direction of self-propulsion parallel to each other. Whereas in the presence of pneumatic alignment, particles can align either parallel or anti-parallel to each other with equal probability. So we performed Brownian dynamic simulations of this model, and we fixed the average density of the system, and then we tuned these two parameters that you see here. The first one is called the Peckle number and quantifies the strength of the self-propulsion speed compared to rotational noise. The second one, quantifies, is this G parameter, quantifies the strength of the alignment interaction between neighboring particles, again, compared to rotational noise. And so by performing Brownian dynamic simulations, we were able to build these phase diagrams that you see here. And each of these phase diagrams corresponds to adding a, a different type of effective torque between particles. So you see that they present very different features. So from left to right in the phase diagram, we are increasing the G, we are increasing the alignment strength between neighboring particles. So we expect the system to go from a disordered state in the space of orientations to an ordered state, where basically the system picks up a preferred direction and all particles align along that direction. And from bottom to top, we are increasing the Peckle number, so the self-propulsion speed. So the system becomes more active. And then, in the absence of alignment, people have reported a phase separation. And this phase separation, where the system goes from a homogeneous to a phase separated state, is understood in the context, in the context of motility-induced phase separation. Now, as I already mentioned, there are very different features in these phase diagrams, depending on whether we add ferromagnetic or pneumatic alignment. For instance, take a look at the snapshots E and H. 
these are systems which are well above the onset of flocking. So the system has developed global orientational order. You can see this by the color of the particles. The color is the orientation. So they are, in the case of snapshot E, they are all pointing along the same direction. So if this were a video, you would just see that this structure just moves collectively. And this is in the case of adding ferromagnetic alignment. Now, if we add pneumatic alignment, we see the snapshot H. And here you see that the system also picks up a preferred axis along which particles align, but now they align in opposite directions. And these are the two color domains that you see in the snapshot. But as I told you, we were interested in understanding what happens to MIPS in the presence of alignment. And for this, what we did is we always kept the regime in the limit, in the, in the regime of weak coupling. So when this G parameter, this G alignment strength is not strong enough to fully, uh, so that the system does not develop a global orientational order. And then we turn on ferromagnetic alignment and we slowly increasing it, uh, we slowly increase it. And then we observe that actually the motility induced phase separation takes place at lower values of the PECLE as you increase G. So this is basically telling us that actually ferromagnetic alignment is enhancing the system's phase separation. So it's actually easier for particles to aggregate in the presence of ferromagnetic alignment. On the contrary, when we add pneumatic alignment, we observe that the critical PECLE, and I'm looking at the blue squares, the critical PECLE at which the phase separation takes place is independent of the value of the alignment strength. So this is actually telling us that pneumatic alignment has a neutral effect on the system's phase separation. And we thought this was very interesting phenomenology, and I will go back to talk more about these results. But first, let me introduce the last model I wanted to talk about today. And this one is called the dipolar active Brownian particle model. And as far as I'm aware, it was first proposed by Gujun Liao and Zavine Klapp from TU Berlin, with whom we are nowadays collaborating. And so this model basically describes active Brownian particles, which carry a permanent dipole, which points along the direction of self-propulsion of these particles. So they have this model described by these over dumb Langevin equations. And you see here that, in, that the interaction potential has contributions from steric repulsion and also from dipole-dipole interactions. So they saw that dipolar interactions are also a way, are also a mechanism to introduce effective alignment in the system. But of course, this alignment is of different nature than the one I was talking about before, because dipolar interactions are, first of all, long-ranged. And second, if you look at the dipole-dipole potential in the second term, you see that it couples dipolar moments with positions of particles. So now, effective alignment between particles will not only depend on their relative orientation, like it was in the Witzek-like alignment rules, but it also will depend on the relative position in space. And so they performed running dynamic simulations and they published a paper where they have this very nice sketch. And I'm gonna uh, look at uh, panel A and B. So panel A and B are configurations that are stable in a passive system of dipoles. So you see that in this uh, configuration A, so it's a head to tail configuration, particles tend to align parallel to each other. While in the case of having a side by side configurations, particles tend to align anti-parallel to each other as a consequence of the energy minimization. Now they, wondered what happens when I introduce activity. So in the first case, they saw that activ activity leaves configuration A stable. So particles will for some time move in this given configuration until the fluctuation set in. But on the contrary, when you introduce activity in a configuration of type B, activity, activity just destabilizes this configuration because particles just swim away. So they concluded that Dipolar interactions favor this head-to-tail polar alignment between particles. And so they performed Brownian dynamic simulations. Okay, well, these you cannot see very well, the, the legend, but uh, never mind. So this is the phase diagram they, they built from their Brownian dynamic simulations. And here, lambda is the dipolar coupling. 
And so here is the parameter that controls the effective alignment between particles. So they observed actually that <laughs> the kind of values of lambda, they see flocking states. And this V0 is a redefinition of the Peclet number, but it's essentially the same. So it's quantifying the strength of self-propulsion speed compared to uh, rotational noise. So as I told you for our work, we were interested in the low coupling regime. So when the system still does not develop global orientational order. And what they observe is that actually, as we increase lambda, as we increase, increase the dipolar coupling, the phase separation takes place at higher values of the Peclet. So basically the conclusion is that dipolar interactions hinder MIPS. And then I think that at this point is good to recap. And here I have shown you, I mean, I have shown, here you can see the three phase diagrams that I have been talking about. And you can already see that depending on the alignment mechanism that we are considering, this alignment mechanism has different effects on the motility induced phase separation happening in systems of active Brownian particles. So in the case of adding ferromagnetic alignment, MIPS is enhanced. In the case of adding nematic, nematic alignment, this has a neutral effect on the system's phase separation. And finally, in this more, more recent work, if we add dipole-dipole interactions between particles, we see that MIPS is hindered. So this is, we thought, quite interesting. And this is evidencing that different alignment rules have different effects on the system's phase separation induced by motility. And then we also thought that it would be interesting to derive a coarse grain description that hopefully could capture this kind of behavior and that could possibly give us some more insight into why this phenomenology happens. So this is why we moved on and we, pro we uh, proposed this n body Smolukovsky equation which describes a system, again, of self-propelled particles, and they self-propel at the constant velocity V0. They are subject to thermal and rotational noise. And we model the interactions between particles with this capital U potential. Now, this capital U potential encodes the specificities of each model. So here you can add contributions from steric repulsion and also from different alignment rules. But in principle, this and by this Molukovsky equation is general and it can account for the different models I have presented you. And this is also cool because as I will show you, we are able to derive a coarse grain description, but the nice thing is that we are starting from the microscopic dynamics. So we are starting from this equation. And then it's quite standard to integrate out n minus one variables of the n by this Molukovsky equation and then we can obtain the one body Smolukovsky equation, where here pairwise correlations between particles are encoded in this effective force and this effective torque. And this force and this torque are, are the effective force and torque that the tagged particle or particle one feels due to the surrounding particles. Now, this is exactly the same equation I was just showing you. This constitutes the first equation of a hierarchy of coupled equations, where Two body, where the coupling with two body terms is encoded in this force and this torque. So then to move on, we propose to decompose the two body probability distribution as you see here. And this two body probability distribution is actually encoded in, in F and T. So we decompose it as product of one body probability distributions times the average density of the system and times this correlation function. And then here I'm going to cut the long story short, but um, we are able, uh, by inserting this decomposition into the one body Smolukovsky equation and rearranging the terms, we are able to rewrite the one body Smolukovsky equation in this other form that you see here, where now all the pairwise correlations between particles have been encoded in this zeta and this epsilon coefficients which have the functional forms that you see at the bottom of the slide. And as you see, they depend on the correlation function that we have defined. So, so far, 
I am keeping the two body correlations and I'm just rewriting the equations. And now I will proceed by performing a mean field approximation. And mean field approximation here means that from now on, I will consider that these two coefficients are just simple constants. They are constant parameters. So I'm forgetting about the correlations between particles and therefore I'm cutting the hierarchy of coupled equations. And so once we perform this mean field approximation, we can also define the first three moments of the probability distribution, which are the density field, the polarization, and the pneumatic tensor. And then we're able to derive this set of effective hydrodynamic equations, which look like these ones that you see here. And then at this point, what we did to proceed is we performed a linear stability analysis. So we did this. And this means that we take the homogeneous and isotropic solution, which is a solution of this set of equations, and we add a tiny perturbation to it. And then we study whether this perturbation grows or decays in time. If it decays in time, it means that the system is stable and it will go back to the homogeneous and isotropic state. But if it grows in time, it means that the system destabilizes. And this is signaling the onset of a phase separation. And so we were able to identify the region of instability as a function of the relevant parameters. And this is the blue area. I'm not sure if you can see it, but here there's like a blue area. So this is the region in which we expect to see the onset of a phase separation. So this is the prediction given by the coarse grain mean field model. But if you remember, I also told you that this zeta coefficient actually encodes the pairwise correlation between particles. And let me just first state that here uh, in this plot that you see, I've set epsilon to zero. And one can prove by symmetry arguments that in all the models we want to consider, this epsilon has to be always identically zero. So from now on, I will just proceed and I will just consider uh, the zeta coefficient. So since we know that the zeta coefficient encodes the microscopic information of the system, this is a direct way that is, like, it's giving us the opportunity to compare the results obtained from the coarse grain description with the actual microscopic model. And so this means that we can actually compute numerically the value of zeta, and then we can compare it to, to the mean field prediction. And to compute this value numerically, we also need to compute this correlation function. And beyond getting a numerical value for zeta, computing this correlation function is interesting because it's giving you information about the structure of the system. And so now I will show you some results that we got from computing this correlation function numerically from our Brownian dynamic simulations. And first, let me briefly mention the choice of variables that we did. So here, R is the distance between a pair of particles. Theta is the angle encompassed between the direction of soft propulsion of particle one and the vector distance be, uh, connecting the two particles. And then phi is the orientation difference between these two particles. And then we compute integrated correlation function. So here we are integrating over phi. So we are integrating over all the possible relative orientations between particles. And so this correlation function is basically giving us the probability to find another particle at a certain distance r from the tagged particle and in a certain given direction in the plane. And here I will show you some results of computing this correlation function numerically. This is the passive case, so no activity and no alignment. Here we expect this uh, correlation function to be isotropic as it is. So there is no preferred direction in which we will find particles. So all the directions in the plane are the same, are equally probable. Then what happens when we introduce activity? So now we have a finite Peckle number. So now we are breaking the head to tail symmetry. So this means that it's more probable to find particles in front of the tagged particle than behind. 
And this is a consequence of the collision persistence that is introduced by activity. And this is what eventually will lead to the system's phase separation. Now, if we go on and we also include ferromagnetic alignment between particles, we see that the anisotropic structure of the system is enhanced. And it's even more probable to find particles in front than behind of me. And finally, in the case of pneumatic alignment, you see that the structure of the system is very similar, it's almost the same, as in the case of only act having activity, so in the case of active Brownian particles. So pneumatic alignment does not alter, does not influence the structure of the system. These are some results for this integrated correlation function. I would also like to show you some other results we got from another integrated correlation function, and this one is the G of R phi. So here I'm integrating over theta, so I'm integrating over all the possible directions in the plane. So this correlation function is giving you the probability to find another particle at a distance r from the tagged particle, and with a certain relative orientation. And actually this results that I'm gonna show you now, we found them quite interesting. So first of all, I'm gonna show you the passive case. And in the passive case, we expect this correlation function to be isotropic. There is no preferred relative orientation between particles. All of them are equally probable. Now, the results I'm gonna show you next are all performed, are, are all obtained from simulations at G0. So there is no alignment here. It's just a simple, system of active Brownian particles. What we observe is that upon increasing a little bit the Peclet, so at this value of the Peclet, the system is not active enough to fully phase separate, so we still have a homogeneous system, but we observe that there, there is a symmetry breaking between relative orientations, uh, between the alignment and the, so between the parallel and the anti-parallel alignment. We observe, I'm not sure if you can see it from there, but we observe that it is more probable to find anti-parallel configurations than parallel ones. And this happens in the absence of alignment. And we understand this because when we add activity to the system, when particles can self-propel, they show a collision persistence, right? So when they collide, they get stuck for a while. And this collision persistence is favoring the anti-parallel alignment between particles. And then if we keep on increasing the, the Peclet number, and here we are in the phase separated state, we observe that this symmetry breaking also happens, but now the more probable configurations are the parallel ones. So it's more probable to find parallels, uh, particles aligned parallel than anti-parallel. And we understand this because in a MIPS cluster, we know that at the border of the cluster, on average, particles are pointing towards the center of the cluster. So there is actually an orientational correlation, which is an interfacial effect. And this is what we are capturing with these integrated correlation functions. But this a priori surprised us because I would have said that if there is no effective alignment between particles, one should not see any orientational correlations. But this proved me wrong. So, now I, I've shown you that we are able to compute numerically these correlation functions. And this is what we need to get, here it is, to get the numerical values of zeta. And what I'm showing here is the comparison between the coarse-grained mean field description and the microscopic model. So the numerical values of zeta are plotted in uh, points of different color. So first look at the case with no alignment, so G0 or lambda zero. As you see, these points, the numerical values of zeta at low values of the Peclet are in the wide region, so this is a stable region where the system is homogeneous, and as you increase the Peclet, they penetrate into the instability region. And this is giving us the onset of the phase separation. Now, if we increase the ferromagnetic alignment, we observe that these numerical values of zeta penetrate into the instability region at lower values of the Peclet as we increase G. 
And this is in accordance with what I was showing you before from the results we got from simulations, right? Because ferromagnetic alignment is actually enhancing the system's phase separation. Then if we now turn and look at the pneumatic case, we observe that the numerical values of zeta penetrate into the instability region at approximately the same value of the PECLE. And it doesn't depend on the value of the alignment strength. So pneumatic alignment has a neutral effect on the system destabilization. And finally, this is ongoing work with uh, dipolar interactions. But we observe that upon increasing lambda, these numerical values of zeta penetrate into the instability region at higher values of the PECLE, which also coincides with the simulations of Gujun and uh, Zavine, where they saw that dipolar interactions are actually hindering MIPS. So with this comparison, I've shown you that we are able to derive a coarse-grained model that can describe the systems that we want to study. So systems of active Brownian particles with different alignment rules. I have shown you that it's generable enough so that it can account for different types of alignment rules. And I also have shown you that it provides a way to map the coarse-grained mean field model to the microscopic model. So just to finish, I will state the conclusions and the overview. So today I have presented you a model that decouples the shape of particles from the alignment rule. I have shown you that the phase behavior observed in systems of active Brownian particles strongly depends on the aligning torque that you consider. And I have shown you the different impacts that this torque has on the motility-induced phase separation. And then I also presented a theoretical coarse grain description that can account for the behavior observed in these systems. And it provides us with a general enough uh, model to study these systems. And finally, you could see how we can directly map this coarse grain model to the microscopic model, so to our Brownian dynamics simulations. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions. Yes, so the question is, what? Well, yeah, yeah, go go ahead. Tell me the second one then. No, no, no. I, I, I wanted to ask you, so, so the two of you, that's correct, right? What I... Yes, exactly. So, so does that mean that uh, activity favors the um, creation of the process? So, yeah, so the question of Carlos is, whether activity favors the formation of chains, and if he understood correctly that activity favors this uh, head-to-tail configuration over the side-by-side -side configuration. So the chains are formed, as far as I understand, because of the dipolar interaction. But what Zavine and Gujun claim is that when you add activity to a passive system of dipolar particles, activity won't destroy this chain formation, and particles that are forming chains are now able to self-propel collectively. That's what they claim. But the chain formation mechanism is due to the dipolar interactions. So if you didn't have dipolar interactions in a system of just active Brownian particles, you, no one observes chain formation. Yes. 
Indonesia. So what Carlos is asking is if activity, so when you have a passive dipolar system, uh, these particles can arrange into chain-like structures or into carpets. And then for what I know, what they observe in their simulations is that at systems that are not very um, dense, they see the formation of chains, but they don't see the formation of carpets. That's what they present in this soft matter paper of 2020. So I'm not sure if um, what is the effect of activity on carpets. Yes, so the question is whether these correlation functions already contain the information that the system is phase separated or in the homogeneous state. So of course, these correlation functions are a consequence of the structure of the system, right? So in the phase separated state, we observe some kind of correlation functions in which we see that there is a lot more structure. So here you are already in the phase separated state and also here so of course this is telling you about the structure and this depends on the fact that the system is phase separated because in the phase separated state and this is phase separation is induced by activity so by a competition between self-propulsion and uh, excluded volume effects what you see is that it's actually more probable uh, as a consequence of this collision persistence right you see that it's more probable to find other particles in front of you than behind. And this is a signature of the phase separation, of course. Yes, in, on the opposite, if you were in a isotropic system, uh, sorry, in a passive system, or also in a homogeneous system, you wouldn't see this uh, symmetry breaking between head and tail. So, okay, the question is the power of prediction of the theory. So, are you asking if by just looking at these correlation functions, we could already know in which uh, state we are? Is this the question? Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. So, the question. Yes. Uh, so, if you weren't able to do that, what what use is the is the mean field model? You cannot. You have no other way of uh, estimating what the correlation happens without the other. Field. Okay. So the question is, what 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 is the the use or the 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 new thing that the coarse grain model adds? Uh, to predict the onset of phase separation. So, if we are, if we just stay in the uh, in the prediction that the coarse grain model gives, you would think that in all this region you can see the onset of a phase separation. So, for all these values of zeta and all these peclets, you actually can have a system that is phase separated. And this is just this zeta that is a coefficient measuring the arrest of particles due to collisions. Okay, so the prediction of the model 
of the theoretical coarse grain model is this one. And then what you can do is you can, for example, start studying epsilon and then you can think of also introducing effective torques. And this is the information that the model can give you. It's just inside this region, you would expect to see the onset of a phase separation. Now, the cool thing is that since we can also map it to simulations, we can get a more accurate prediction. But of course, this prediction that is given by the numerical values of zeta is only um, valid in the model we're using. I mean, this is a prediction, but it's... Exactly, exactly, yes. And it's directly linked to the Browning dynamic simulations. The equation... Here. Here, this zeta and this epsilon. Okay. Yes. 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 Yes, because if you look at the functional form of epsilon, you see that, and here it's the, this function W, which depends on the relative orientation between particles. This depends on the type of alignment mechanism you are introducing, right? So in the Witschek model, this would be a sign of the phase difference. Then upon integrating a sign of the phase difference and this correlation function, which has left to right symmetry, so it's the same to find particles with a relative given orientation phi or minus phi. So this is a pair function in phi multiplied by an odd function of phi. Upon integration, it vanishes. So this is model dependent. In the type of alignment rules we are considering, this epsilon vanishes. And of course, all these, all the things I've discussed today are only valid in the weak coupling regime. So when alignment is not strong enough to, for the system to develop global orientational order. So in this regime, the mechanism that controls the phase separation, and this is our claim, is the one which comes from the competition between self-propulsion and excluded volume effects. So it's a MIPS effect. It's not induced by local alignment. And then of course, like in the, in, the, in the subsequent derivation, that's why, because the models we are using um, impose that this epsilon has to be zero, then we don't consider this, we set it to zero, and then we just look at the zeta parameter. Exactly, yeah, this is, this is applied only to this regime. So it's first order, but I don't know if the alignment could modify. We haven't looked at that, actually. So I don't know. Exactly. When we add pneumatic alignment, it's just the same. I mean, it doesn't have effect on the... This is a good question, because we've been discussing about this a lot. And I, I still don't have an exact intuition of why this happens. What I think is that in the case of ferromagnetic alignment, so when you have ferromagnetic alignment between neighboring particles, what this makes is that it kind of freezes the, the orientational degrees of freedom. So it takes more time for particles to decorrelate their direction of self-propulsion because they are subject to this effective polar alignment. 
In the case of pneumatic alignment, it's a bit harder to tell. Yeah, but when they are when they are close and they feel this uh, torque, they want to stay. Uh, I mean, they don't. In the case exactly, in the case of pneumatic alignment, then we were considering this. Um, I mean, I don't know, maybe like argument, uh, hand wavy argument that if you think that you have a cluster, a MIPS cluster, and then you have one of these pneumatic aligning particles that is approaching, with a certain probability, it will align uh, parallel to the particles in the cluster, but with a certain probability, it can also align anti-parallel and swim away. You could think that this is an effect that compensates the aggregation, but it's very hand wavy. So no, we don't have a clear intuitive argument. So, in the phase diagram, here, so this wide region is non-physical because in this wide region, the effective, so this is something we don't consider because, the, yeah, yeah, so all that matters is below this, uh, yeah, this line. Can you Yes, because at this regime, if you go back here, so this is the effective velocity that depends on the parameter, the soft portion velocity that you set, and it also depends on this zeta coefficient. So in the region of the phase diagram that I was saying it's non-physical is because this effective velocity would be negative. That's why we don't consider it. Yeah. Is there any well, thank you very much for that.